Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we come before you. You are a great God. We recognize you as great. So, Father, we thank you that your greatness will be demonstrated today and displayed today by your spirit. Father, we declare that nothing will be done by flesh, but all will be done by your spirit. We yield, we yield, we yield, Father. And, Father, we thank you, Lord, that our hearts are good ground. And, Father, we thank you that the seed of your word will take root and bring forth fruit that's pleasing and acceptable unto you as your spirit disperse your seed today. We give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Well, God bless you guys. Give each other the high five and amen. You may be seated. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Well, let me get set up here. Okay. All right. Good deal. Oh, man. God is good. God is good. It is so good to... Let me tell you something. I can't even imagine living life without God. Uh, you know, I, 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 the people out here in the world nowadays... I'm, I'm like, you know, how you do, how do you do it? And really, they're not doing it. I mean, they're just suffering through it. You know what I'm saying? They're suffering through it. They get up the next day. They wonder. Uh, they start feeling hopeless. And then, you know, you turn to drugs or you turn to vices or turn to a lot of things. You, uh, so many people are dealing with depression yeah. nowadays. This is, this is crazy. Um, but, amen, it shall not come near us. Praise God. Now, it might try. It might try because, you know, some things happen. You might hear some news or something might happen to you, and, and it tries to come, but it's like, nope. Praise God. A thousand shall fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand. See, that means it's close. It's at my side. It's at my right hand. It's close, but it shall not come nigh me. Amen? So I tell you, we are putting off all of these things that are happening in the world, I will not be a statistic. I will not be a statistic. You know, depression has increased by such and such percent. I ain't in that. Suicides have increased by such and such percent. That ain't me. You know what I'm saying? Um, worrying, you know, lack. No, that ain't me. That ain't me. I understand that uh, I have a heart for people that are dealing with that. I'm not callous. I'm not cold. I'm not insensitive. I'm sympathetic. I'm empathetic. Uh, I can relate to you. The Lord brought me out of that. You know what I'm saying? But no, I'm not going to stay in it. He brought me out of it. So I'm not going to be like a pig wallowing in the mire. Neither am I going to be like a dog returning back to his vomit. So if God brought me out of that, I I'm not going back in it. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Well, listen, we are, um, I will start off, as I should, by giving honor to Pastor and Pastor Taffy and, and always uh, appreciating them so much uh, for what they are doing and, and the way that they are leading us and instructing us into righteousness. Uh, as I've said before, uh, and, you know, I mean, I won't harp on it. I know Pastor really doesn't did, like all the accolades and stuff like that, but uh, the thing about it is the way that the Spirit of God is ministering to them and that the way he has this congregation because he's the shepherd of this flock. He's not the shepherd of the world. All the world always trying to make comments. It's like, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> he wasn't talking to you. Why, why you keep butting in our conversation? But for this congregation, uh, it, it's, it's the way that the Lord is leading us and it is leading us. He's uh, the teaching that that they're doing is leading us to this more intimate, personal, dependent relationship upon God. You know, we see ourselves getting out of the way more and more and more. We're doing what John says, I must decrease, but he must increase. And that's what we're doing, and we're, coming, we're becoming more and more conscious of it. As I was saying last week, you know, the world has this saying that uh, God is my co-pilot. Sounds sweet, sounds good, sounds spiritual, but no, 
if God is co-piloting, co-piloting, then that means he got half and you got half, probably. Somewhere you're involved in it. But we need to get you out of the way. So don't make God a co-pilot. Let God be the pilot. Amen? Praise God. So, you know, we were talking about will, our will, and how our will gets in the way of what God has purpose and what God has planned for us uh, to carry out this, his will for our lives. So the thing about wills is that God started it off and he gave man a free will. So man can operate his will independent of God if he chooses to. He can operate his will independent of God because God set it up that way, whereas he told Adam and Eve what to do and what not to do if you choose to do this, which means that you have a will to choose to do this. If you choose to eat of this tree, then the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, he didn't make it where Adam had no choice. Adam was com completely controlled by the Spirit of God, and whether Adam wanted to or not, he couldn't do it. God didn't make it that way. He gave him a will. He made man with a will, with a free choice, with the ability to make choices. So now that means that he's given man this independence to see if he will take his independence and be dependent upon God. Does that make sense? He will take his independence and be dependent upon God. So that's where when Jesus came uh, on the scene, we see in Luke 22 and 42. Let's go and let's read that uh, to start off with that again. Luke 22, 42. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. I told you Gethsemane means a pressing of the seed uh, where this oil comes out, this anointing comes out because it's pressing the flesh. It's, it's pressing, it's pressing um, uh, the flesh, it, whereas that goodness that's in you comes out only when it's pressed. When there's no pressure, that anointing that's in you doesn't come out. So Gethsemane means that. It means the pressing of the seed. So he was in Gethsemane praying. Remember he had Peter, James, and John with, John with them, told them to pray with them. Uh, they were falling asleep. The flesh was the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. Uh, but Jesus pressed on, and he went a little farther, and he prayed, and he prayed. He saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Because he had known, the Father had revealed to him what you are going to have to do in order to redeem man back to, uh, back to me. So Jesus had a, had a fleshly moment. Now, we got to keep in mind that when Jesus came, Jesus was all God, but he was all human. Here, this human part shows up. This human part says, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to. I know because he had already told the disciples, uh, the Son of Man is going to be turned over to the scribes, Pharisees and all, and they shall whip him and they shall kill him. So he knew how he was going to die. He, uh, he had already been telling the disciples. So that human part came up where he was like, mm, even though I know the will of God, and I'm going to pause there for a second because a lot of us know the will of God, but yet and still when it comes to doing the will of God, it gets a little hard. So Jesus knew the will of God, told the disciples what's, what's supposed to happen, but yet and still, when he came to this point here in Gethsemane where it's, it's pressure time, it's, it's time now. I've known it, but now it's time for it to happen. Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Then he quickly got out of himself. He quickly got out of his independent will and lined his will up with God's will. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So here Jesus was showing us because he was a demonstration for us. He was an example for us. The Bible talks about in 1 Peter, I think it's 1 Peter, that, that Jesus being an example for us, that we should walk in his footsteps or follow in his footsteps, or he's shown us how to, how to walk this life. He talks about how he, um, he has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He can relate to us. He understands what we're dealing with. But he had to go through it himself 
as a man, even though God, but as a man, he had to go through it so that I can now relate to you. If I haven't really dealt with this, I think I know what you're talking about. I don't really know what you're talking about. But no, he dealt with the things that we dealt with. So Jesus here was showing us that there's this situation that will come whereas you will know the will of God, but yet and still you will be pressured in your flesh not to do it. You have to come to a quick conclusion as quickly as you can, as quickly as you can get past your flesh and say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So line your will up with God's will. Now, the thing about God's will is that, let's look at Romans, the 12th chapter and the uh, second verse. The thing about God's will um, is that in God's will, you can find trouble in the perfect will of God. Now, the way that we sometimes tend to measure the will of God is by the lack of trouble. If we have trouble, we say, that ain't God. Can I get a witness? Amen. Anybody ever been there? Man, that ain't God. I ain't got to, God wouldn't have me to go through all that. That ain't, that ain't God. I don't even want to hear it. Yeah, but you know, God might, nah, that ain't God. Well, uh, there are many times in the Bible where there was trouble in the perfect will of God. Three Hebrew boys. Trouble. Perfect will of God. They're, they're about to, to deal with the fiery furnace. What was the will of God? That you don't bow down to idols. That's the will of God. That was the perfect will of God because I am God. I have no other God before me. Don't bow down to idols. Okay, God, we're doing your will. But doing your will got us put in the fiery furnace perfect will of God, but there was trouble in the perfect will of God. God will deliver you out of all of them. That's the thing we got to still remember. God will deliver you out of all of them, but you cannot say that you're not in the will of God because you run into some trouble. Uh, Daniel, Lion's Den. Shad, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the king name? Nebuchadnezzar, somebody. Cyrus, one of them. Uh, him. <laughs> Uh, got food into making a decree, his councilmen said, listen, you're, you're the greatest king in the world, and you know what, let's make a decree that for however many hours or days, nobody can serve any other god besides you. They knew Daniel prayed three times a day in the open window for everybody to see him that he's praying to another god. Perfect will of God. Daniel said, Daniel knew the decree. When the decree came down, he knew what was up. But it was like, Daniel, nope, I'm praying. Perfect will of God. But yet and still, I get thrown in the lion's den. Jesus. <laughs> Woo. Knowing already the Father has revealed to him what's going to happen. This is what you got to go through, Jesus. Uh, you got to go to the scribes and these Pharisees when they came in the Garden of Gethsemane because uh, Judas had led them there and Peter pulled out his sword and slashed off an ear and Jesus said, chill out, Peter. This, this, this got to happen. This has to happen. I got to go to Jerusalem. I got to get up on that cross. So, trouble in the perfect will of God. But here in Romans, the 12th chapter, chapter and the second verse, he says, And be not conformed to this world. Don't, be, don't, don't act like the world. I think one translation say the, the, the rules and the regulation and almost like the socialization of the world. Don't, don't be changed into that. It says, but be transformed or changed by having the way that you think, the way that you see, the way that you conclude, the way that you look at things. You got to have that way changed. Now, how, how does it change? It's changed according to the word of, word of God. God tells us how to think. God tells us how to approach things. We learn them as we come into uh, services like this and continue to read our Bible. So he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove 
get your mind renewed so you can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect what? Will of God. Get your mind changed and you can prove that the will of God is good, it's perfect, and it's acceptable. Mm. Get your mind changed and you can prove that the will of God is good, perfect, and acceptable even when I'm in the midst of trials. Boy, this preaching ain't too acceptable. <laughs> You got folks like, yeah, you know what, that's good. Pastor Ken, you made it sound all good and rhyming and all that stuff, but, you know, that ain't God. <clears throat> but it is God. So we see examples in the Bible, and I'm not going to turn to it all, but I'm just going to give you some other examples so that you know Jonah. Jonah. The will of God. Jonah, go down to Nineveh. Since you call yourself a preacher, I want you to preach to those people down in Nineveh, and I want you to tell them what I say, not what you want to say. But Jonah's like, I don't like those Ninevites. They're a bunch of hoodlums, and they just, you know, they all, they're carnal, they're fleshly. Surely me being a holy God, you don't want me to go down there. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, nope. <laughs> Ain't going to do it. God was like, all right. All right, I'll just put some tenderizer on that tail. <laughs> I'll just tenderize that tail a little bit in the, in, the, in, the, in the form of a whale. It started with him on the ship, and, and everything was going wrong on the ship. And folks were like, what is going on? We never dealt with anything like this. And Jonah had to come out and say, it's me. It's me. I am running from God, and God is trying to get my attention. So if y'all throw me overboard, all of this will stop. And they were like, they were trying to figure out another way to do it. No, there's got to be another way. We don't want to just throw a man overboard. And it wasn't stopping. And Jonah said, listen, I'm telling you, it's me. Now, you would have thought then Jonah would have been like, okay, God, I'll do your will, I'll do your will. But no, Jonah was like, ah, oh, just throw me overboard, and it stopped. Surely they threw him overboard, and the storm stopped. Well, you know, of course, Jonah become whale food, and, uh, and so he, he's consumed. And, of course, when he's in the belly of the whale, he has uh, an epiphany. Uh, the bell burps him up, uh, goes, and Jonah now fulfills the will of God. So... I think what the Lord is trying to say is that we really don't have to really go through all that. Let's, let's just kind of decide and be like Jesus. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, hey, yes, amen. Give God praise for that. Cause he, no Jonah for me. No well for me. Now, <laughs> in another situation, we had the angel to visit Mary comes to Mary, tells Mary, uh, you're going to be pregnant. Uh, you're going to have a child. Mary's like, I know I'm young and all that, but I still understand biology. I haven't been with a man, so how in the world am I going to be pregnant? The Holy Ghost is going to come on you. Yeah, you know, that's, that's real spiritual. Man, that sounds real good. You know, if, if I was in a revival, boy, I'd, I'd eat that up. But no, you're talking right here face to face with me. And you tell me I'm, a, I'm going to be pregnant just by the Holy Ghost coming, coming over me. But Mary didn't wrestle with it too long. She asked that question, how will this be seeing that I don't know a man? I understand biology-wise, a man and a woman got to get together before that happens. That's the way it's been since the beginning of the world. Why is it changing now? because the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. But the thing Mary said, once she understood the will of God, she said, be it unto me according to thy word. So here Mary yields her will to the will of God. And then, of course, we have Jesus who comes on the scene. Now, when we look at these things, we have... 
in every situation, those examples that I've, I've given, that free will comes up. That choice comes up. God's not going to make you do anything. Now, he, you know, Jonah could have been a, could have remained a fool and he would have just died in the belly of the whale. But he, he changed. But God isn't going to make you do anything that you don't want to do. He'll try to nudge you along the way to show you, this is my will for you. I got something better for you. I'm trying to show you that, you know, if you do what I tell you to do, things will, will be better. Because what we have to understand, I think the Bible, um, I think it's 1 Corinthians uh, 13, but it says, we know in part. We understand in part. So we only understand in parts. God sees the whole thing. So whereas your understanding here is limited, God is saying if you go a little further, you'll begin to see more clearly. But if you go a little further, you'll see a little more clearly. If you go ahead and quit, don't quit, don't complain, don't deal with all that. Just go a little further and you'll see more clearly. So here when God is speaking to us about things, here's what we have to trust, lean, depend, rely, what pastor has been teaching on him because he knows in whole what we only know in part. So now... Job said something really, really good. When he was going through what he was going through, Job had that revelation. Job said, though you slay me, now we know it wasn't God who was slaying him. He said, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. What a statement. What a powerful statement. Right now, these trials are kicking my tail. Man, I got boils on me. I'm in sackcloth and ashes and all of this stuff. But you know, Lord, I don't quite understand. I know I serve you. I know I love you. But though this is happening to me, even though we realized that it was the devil, remember when, when the devil came to uh, God saying, you know, um, well, if I do all this stuff to Job, he'll turn from you and God, God allowed it. So it wasn't God doing it. But Job didn't understand that. All Job knew is whatever is going on with me, whatever I'm dealing with, I don't quite understand it. It's hard, but I know I trust you, God. I will trust you. I will trust you. Now, that's, that's, that's hard. That's hard to deal with. That's hard to go with. But I want us to see something here that as we are going along and as we are doing the will of the Father, there's something that we must do in order to progress with God, in order to progress in this walk. Let's go to Amos 3.3. 3. In order to progress in this walk, there has to be aligning, coming into union. Here in Amos, the third chapter and uh, third verse, the question was asked, can two people walk together except they be in agreement? Now, let's look at that in the, in the um, new, let's look at that, uh, let me see, let's look at that in the message. I want to look at it in the message, Amos 3.3, 3, in the message. Then I want to look at it in the New Living Translation. Because, see, our walk is with God. We're walking with God. But it said, can you really walk with me if you're not in agreement with me? If you're not lining your will with my will, are we really, truthfully, are we walking together? Or are you going in a direction and I'm going in a direction, but yet it's still Hey, God, how you doing? It's almost like your neighbors. You know what I'm saying? It's, you, you come out, it's, you see your neighbor over there. Hey, neighbor, 
How you doing? Like, let's, let's get together and let's talk rather than us being a distance from God. Here, Amos 3.3. 3. Do two people walk hand in hand if they aren't going the same place? Can you walk hand in hand if you're not going the same place? Now, I would say that God is the one who's directing. So, you know, we need to be going where he's going. But in order to go where he's going, we need to be walking hand in hand. Because if you can imagine, if I had another person up here with me, and we're walking hand in hand, and I choose to go left, and they choose to go right, something's got to give. Either you're going to pull my arm out, or I'm going to pull your arm out, or either we're going to let go because we're going in different directions. So can we walk together unless our wills are in, a, in alignment? Can we walk together knowing that, when we, um, uh, that God is the one who's leading and that we're just walking along with him? Now let's look at that in the uh, NLT real quickly. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? <laughs> without agreeing on the direction. Now, here's the thing about it. It isn't so much a conversation back and forth. It's God saying, I got the direction for your life. So really, the agreement has to come on our part, agreeing with him. It's not like he's saying, oh, what do you think? How do you think your life should go? We, we're like, I don't know, you're God. That's why we, we're asking you. He's like, exactly, I am God. So just listen to me, be in agreement with me, and walk with me. I'll take you there. I'll get you there. Just trust me. Trust me. Trust me. I'll get you there. I got it. I got it. Listen, I had this direction planned out from the foundation of the world. I already knew where I'm going to take you. Just agree with me. Set your will with my will, and we'll get there. As they say, we go in places. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So it's a matter of us lining our will up with God's will. Now let's go over this just real quickly because it's important that we know God's will. Now that's a whole nother, you know, message trying to understand God's will. But I don't, I don't want to make it real, real hard. It's not real difficult. There are a number of scriptures. Just go and, and do a study. Just say, search the will of God. And you'll, you'll see up there, the will of God is your sanctification. The will of God is that you give thanks. The will of God, a number of these things indicate the will of God for your life. It's not hard. It's not difficult. It's not spooky. You know how we try to, oh, I'm looking for the will of God for my life. What is that? I don't know. Uh, a lot of it's already written down. Just, just read it and let the Holy Spirit help you to live it. It's, it's not hard. Oftentimes, when people are talking about what, what's the will, what the will of God is for their lives, they're talking about what will be my career. Most of the time. What's the will of God for my life? You mean, what will be my career? What will be my occupation? What will be my job? That's what you're saying. That's not real hard, to be honest with you. What do you like doing? What do you like doing? Pursue that. If God doesn't want you doing it, he has ways to get your attention, tell you, no, I don't want you doing that. But we don't have to make it super spooky. What do I like doing? I like drawing. I like artistic stuff. I like being creative. I, you know what? I like working with my hands. I like being outside. I like, you know, pursue it. Pursue it. Y'all got quiet on me. Y'all like, really? It's, no, it's got to be more spiritual than that. No, man, just, just what do you like doing? And then, then go. Did somebody say that's deep? 
and then just, just go for it. Go for it. Most, most of the stuff, the reason that we're oftentimes in job and, and are unhappy, because what? We're not doing what we like doing. It's real simple. Why you hate your job? Because I don't like it. <laughs> well, find something that you like doing. Or just shut up. Amen. You know, it's just, it's like, let's not make it super, super hard. It's, it's not. We, we see sometimes when you get in that situation and you're like, well, I don't know what to do. Then what do you do? Nothing. I don't know what to do. Well, what are you going to do? Nothing, because I don't know what to do. So how far are you getting along with that? You're standing in one place because you're twirling your thumb. I don't, I don't know. You know, I guess the Lord showed me in, in a minute. And then a year's gone by, the Lord showed you anything? No, you know, he hadn't showed me anything. Really? It could be that what you set your hands to do, do it. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's <laughs> Take it, leave it. Yeah. It's all right. All right, so let's look at this real quickly. Uh, Matthew, the 16th chapter. And we talked about this a little bit uh, last time. Matthew, the 16th chapter, and talking about the will still, um, where we think this is why it's so important really to, to get in the Word, get up on the good teaching, get good direction and good understanding, so that as you walk, you're walking with understanding, you're walking with clarity, uh, I'm so thankful that the Lord allowed uh, me and Pastor uh, to live when we had that accident back in, in October of 2000. Praise God. That's been 22 years. But you know what has happened since that time? Pastor, thank God, started teaching on grace. Amen. Started teaching on grace. And we got the understanding of grace. And now that I got the understanding of grace, I under understand things much better now because I understand I understand things through dispensations. Old law, new grace. This doesn't apply anymore. This applies now because what I was trying to do before was I was trying to make all the old stuff apply to now. It doesn't apply. So now I've come into understanding. It's like, oh, man, that makes sense. Now I understand why I was wrestling with that for years. It seemed like, you know, over here, uh, you know, uh, an eye for an eye, and, you know, hate your enemies. And, well, you know, the Bible says an eye for an eye. Well, over here it says love your enemies. Okay, well, yeah, but over here it says, yeah, but over here it says, so which one? Well, if you don't understand about grace and about dispensation and about law, you're confused. You think a time will come when somebody did you wrong? Well, an eye for an eye. So that's why, you know, I, I shot him, cussed him out, or stabbed him, or whatever it was that I did to him. He's still alive because I can't go to jail for, for murdering anybody. But, you know, over here, after about a month or so, I might feel bad, uh, bad for you and send you a card uh, to get well, even though I stabbed you, even though I cut you. <laughs> All right, I'm getting silly now. Let me, let me get back to, to my point here. Matthew, the 16th chapter, let's start in the 23rd verse. So we're coming into greater understanding now, and we're able to read the Bible with that understanding of law and grace and, and what things apply and what things do not apply. Um, however, when we are, when we don't understand things, it can become difficult for us to understand the will of God um, and so we can be in conflict with God's will for our lives because we don't really understand the scriptures. We can be in conflict with his will for our lives. Here's what happened with Peter and Jesus. Uh, let's go to the 20, 21st verse, and we'll read down to 23. 21, start at 21, sorry. From that time forth, Jesus... Uh, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem. Remember Jesus, I said Jesus understood what he had to go through. 
He's showing it out to his disciples. He, I got to go to Jerusalem. I got to suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And then I'm going to be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Stop. We don't have to go to the 23rd yet. Peter was operating off of what he had read about the Messiah. The Messiah, they talked about the Messiah coming and setting peace and, and, and putting things back into order and all of that, but Peter did not understand the scriptures. The Messiah will do that, but he must suffer first. So because he didn't understand the scriptures, he couldn't line up with the will of God. So here Peter says, be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now God himself in the person of Jesus just told you what's supposed to happen. The will of God. Remember the will of God? You can have trouble in the perfect will of God. The will of God. But Peter said, this shall not be unto thee. Next verse. But he, being, he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Boy, you talk about a blow to your ego. <laughs> you call me Satan. My name Peter. <laughs> no, but you're acting like the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for you savoreth not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You don't understand what the will of God is. You're still trying to operate in the will of man. And Jesus had to confront him and tell him to get behind him because of those things. Next, let's read on down to 26, and then we'll, I got a point that I need to make. We're going to close out. Then said Jesus unto his disciple, if any man is going to come after me, if you're going to follow me now, you got to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Denying yourself is denying your will. Denying yourself is denying what you want. Your will in simplicity is what you want. That's your will. Um, I will to go to Six Flags. That's what I want to do. I will uh, to, to go to Panera Bread and eat you know, a, a soup and salad. That's what I want to do. I, that's, that's my will. I want to do that. But he was saying, if you're going to try to save your life or keep your will, you'll end up losing it. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. If you lose your will for my will, you'll find life in that. For whosoever will save his life, uh, okay, for what... May, for what it is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and shall lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? That's where your will is in your soulish realm. Your will is in your soulish realm. So if a, what will it profit you if you gain the whole world, but you lose your will, because in the end, your will will lose. <laughs> Amen? But God doesn't, doesn't necessarily want that. Now, let's look at something here. <clears throat> let's go to James, uh, John, excuse me, John, the fourth chapter. And let's talk about the will of God. Let's talk about the, the will of God in terms of what God wants for us. When we talk about will, we're talking about wanting, what God wills for us, what's God's desire for us, what's his intent for us, uh, what's his plan for us. John, the fourth chapter, and let's start in the... Um, uh, Let's start in the 
we'll start here in the first verse, and we'll, we're going to go down to 36, but I'm not going to read every verse. I'll just make points here. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And this is important where he's going. And he must needs, on his way to Galilee, go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour or about noontime. Now keep in mind, I want you to keep this particular uh, verse in mind because, go back, uh, it says that Jesus was wearied from his journey. Okay? Jesus was tired. He was exhausted. He was fatigued. Remember, he was human. So he was tired. He was exhausted. He was fatigued, and he sat down on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Next verse. Then cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Jesus was wearied. He was tired. He was fatigued. Just like with any of us, when we're tired, we're fatigued, we're hungry, we want to eat so that we can regain our strength. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Here we have a social issue. We got a, um, we don't like you, and you don't like us. So we really shouldn't be talking to each other. Now, I'm not going to get into all the history behind it. They didn't like each other. So he says, uh, the Jews, they don't have any dealings with the Samaritans. Next verse. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Living water. <laughs> Next verse. The woman said unto him, uh, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From hence, from whence, then hast thou this living water. Next verse. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof uh, himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water, you're going to thirst again. But, love those buts. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. Now, we're going to come back to John uh, here. We're going to come back here, so keep your place. But let's go to John, the 7th chapter and the 38th verse. What is this water Jesus is talking about? What is this water he's talking about? John 7, 38. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. We're talking about living water again. We just read it in John 4. He, he expounds on it again in John 7, but this time he makes it very clear, the next verse, what the living water is. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, now, all of this reading so far, we got Jesus coming from a long trip. He's tired. He sits at the well. Uh, he sees a Samaritan woman that they really don't have interaction with. And he asks the Samaritan woman to give me water, give me the drink. And the woman said, um, uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't even have anything to draw from the well. And how is it that you asking me a Samaritan uh, for something to drink? 
Uh, and Jesus makes it clear. He says, now, uh, whoever drinks of this water is going to thirst again, but if you drink of the living water that I shall give, you'll never thirst again. The woman said, Lord, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming to this well, because she was carnal. She didn't understand. I have to keep coming to this well, and you'll, you'll make it uh, where I, don't, I will never thirst again. And Jesus made it clear. We went over in John 7. The, Jesus said, the living water that I'm going to give you is the Spirit. I'm going to give you the Spirit, and that Spirit is going to make sure you don't ever thirst again. Now, the thing about the Spirit making sure that you don't thirst again is that the Spirit is saying that I will meet all your needs. Pastor did teaching on this about a couple of weeks ago. I will meet all of your needs to where you, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not what? Want. What I say will is, is to want. The Lord is my shepherd. In other words, since I shall not want, he fulfills all of my will. Can you all flow with me on that? Okay. So God is saying here that I'm going to make sure that your will is satisfied because I know what you need. You think you need the carnal water. You need the spiritual water. Your will seeks the carnal water. The spirit will fulfill the spiritual water. And when you get the spiritual water, you won't ever be thirsty again. And it'll satisfy this carnal thirst as well. All right. So you're all with me on that. He, he, he made, it, made it clear. Now, let's go back to John, the fourth chapter. And um, I want to start at the, at the 33rd verse. Now, Jesus, Jesus had the conversation with the woman. You all can go back there and read that on, on you all's time. He had the conversation with the woman. Uh, the woman, he said, um, uh, go and call your husband. Um, uh, she said, I don't have a husband. He said, true, because, you know, you've had five husbands, and the one that you have with you now, that's not your husband. So Jesus, you know, prophesied to her and peeped her whole card and tell her, yeah, you, you're shacking. That's what you're doing. You're shacking. So the woman gets all excited and says, oh, my goodness. I'm really in the midst of a prophet. This man told me everything that I, I need to go and tell somebody else. So she, she gets ready to break off to go and tell somebody else. By that time, the disciples are coming up, and they look at Jesus talking to a Samaritan. We got a problem. <laughs> We don't talk to Samaritans. Why are you talking to a Samaritan? So, <laughs> oh boy, am I all dramatic. Let me see here. Let me go back to 32, verse 32. <laughs> uh, uh, 31. Woo! In the meantime, while his disciple prayed him, they had come up, they saw, let's go back to 30, okay, let's go back to 30, 30, and then we'll read up. Uh, then they went out of the city and came unto him. The lady had went, told everybody about Jesus. They went out of the city and came unto him. In the meantime, while his disciples prayed him, Jesus saying, Master, eat. Now, back up in John 4, I think it was 7, I told you to remember that because he had gone on a long journey. He was uh, wearied. He was tired. He was hungry. So the disciples came looking at physically what Jesus is going through, and they said, Lord, you need to eat. Next verse. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you don't know of. Hmm. I know before y'all left and went and got food, I was sitting here and I was weary and I was tired and I was fatigued. And then y'all came back and here I am standing up talking, looking like I've been revived. But y'all said, go on, Jesus, you need to eat because we were with you. We were hungry. We know you hungry. But Jesus said, I got meat that you know not of. 
Next verse. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him to eat? Did somebody feed him while we were gone? Jesus, you could have told us because we went a long way to get this meat. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He said, and to finish his work. We're talking about the will of God. We're talking about fulfilling the will of God. We're talking about where if we let these living waters, we drink from this living water, he's going to meet our needs, our wants, and making sure that we have what we need because God is now fulfilling our will. Now, he said here, he said, you all are looking at my natural body, and you're thinking that my natural body functions primarily off of what it gets physically, but I am telling you that my natural body can be sustained by doing what God tells me to do. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The will of God, when we find ourselves in the will of God, you find strength coming upon you that you did not know you had. You find strength coming upon you. See, when, when Elijah ran before uh, uh, Ahab's chariot to the city of Jezreel, the Spirit of God, because God had told him, go, run. I, okay, God, I'm fulfilling your will. And supernaturally, this strength came on him that he ran, outran a chariot, and got to the city before, uh, I think it was Ahab, before he got there. Jesus, fulfilling the will of God, endures a beating by the army, over 600 men, beating him, striking him. He gets scourged. He loses blood. But yet and still, he still has enough strength to carry a cross up the hill to Galgotha. Not on level plain, but we're talking about up the hill. See, it's something that strengthens you when you're fulfilling the will of God. Amen. Jesus gets up on the hill. Yes, Simon comes and carries it for him, but then he gets up on the hill and gets nailed to the cross and gets nailed in the hands and gets nailed in the feet and has the crown of thorns on his head and he's bleeding profusely even more, but yet and still while he's up on the cross, he has enough strength to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He has enough strength to be concerned about his mother. And he looks to John and he said, listen, woman, behold thy son. John, take care of this woman while he's on the cross. He has enough strength to carry on the conversation with the man on the cross next to him. He has enough strength. See, it's something about the empowerment when you're fulfilling the will of God that comes on you that goes past your natural strength. When you're fulfilling the will of God for your life. I've heard our man of God, and he's given testimony, when he had fever of 100 and some odd degrees, but he said, just get me in the pulpit because that's the will of God for my life. And he got up here in the pulpit, and you would never have known when he shared what he's dealt with over these last three years, minus the weight loss, which really he was just eating right so that his body would heal the way that it needed heal, minus the weight loss, you would have never known what he was dealing with because it's the strength that comes upon you when you're fulfilling the will of God. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of God. My substance is to do the will of God. My strength is to do the will of God. When I am doing the will of God, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. I know I'm still in this natural body. I know I got to eat. I get that. But when I'm doing the will of God, I'm not concerned about food. 
you know, like I said, don't get me wrong. I'm not being dumb deep. Yes, you need to eat. You need to drink. You need to do all that stuff there. But it's something about the will of God. When you're doing what God tells you to do, what God wants you to do, that that supernatural gets on you, enabling you to live this supernatural life. But it's in the will of God. But he said, my meat is to do the will of God and to finish his work. See, there's something about the will of God today, the will of God tomorrow, the will of God the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, you're completing the will of God, the strength of God is upon you to bam, to finish his work. When one day will come where we all will face God and we want to hear God say, well done, my good and perfect and, uh, you know, faithful servant. That time is going to come, but he's saying, I will strengthen you to do the will of God in order to finish what I have for you. Now, he made it clear in Matthew 4, I think it's 4. Just write it down, and I'm going to say it because we're out of time. He said, when the devil was tempting him in the wilderness, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, you shall know God be hungry. You're going to fast 40 days and 40 nights. But the devil came to him. If you be the son of God, then you take these stones and make them into bread because I know you're hungry. But Jesus, operating in God's will, could resist that temptation. Why? Because the devil is tempting me to do this. It would be different if God, with his angels, which happened later on, came and fed him and strengthened him. That's different. But no, devil, you're tempting me, and I'm not going to listen to you. So Jesus came up and said, let's go there, John 4, 4. I know I said don't, don't go, but we, we're there, we're there, we're there. John 4, 4. Uh, I'm saying John, I apologize. Matthew 4, 4. Matthew 4, 4. Matthew 4, 4. Jesus, having dealt with all of this, being hungry in his flesh, had to go beyond his flesh. Because right now, for me to tend to the flesh would be for me to bow my knee to the devil. Because he's the one who said, you know you're hungry. Go on and do, take these uh, stones and make them into bread. That means I would have been following and listening and obeying the devil. But Jesus answered and said, it is written. Get this now. Man shall not live by bread alone. But how? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is the will of God. Now, even in the dispensation of time, that was the will of God for that time, but yet and still, we got the will of God now that he, that he shares with us. So I'm not saying every word, now you go back and follow the Old Testament. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying Jesus made the point, when God speaks... A rhema word, that is what you feed off of. That is what you get your strength from. That is what you now connect yourself to. And the Holy Ghost said, I will bring to your remembrance whatsoever thing he has said. And when he brings to your remembrance whatsoever things he has said, with your heart now agreeing to line up with what he said, the supernatural strength comes in. And you find yourself being strengthened. Hallelujah. I have gone way over my time. Hallelujah. Praise God. So listen, we set our will to God's will. For in that we will find strength to accomplish and to fulfill the will of God. Praise God. Listen, we're going to close out and get ready to complete our worship um, if you need an offering envelope, raise your hands and the ushers will get one to you. It is just, 
it's something about doing what God wants us to do. And it starts real simply. He tells us, he says, with the giving, it's, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I, I, I got something in the works here. I, I, I've got something. You may only see in part because what you see in part is your light bill. What you see in part is your, you know, your car note and all that. They, yeah, you got to pay those things. I'm not telling you to be irresponsible. But what God is saying is that I, you, you only see that now. I see a bigger picture. I got something that I want to work out for you. So go ahead on and listen to me. If you hear him speak to you, go ahead on and listen to me. Okay, God, I, you know, I, I, I can't look at that right now. I, I, gotta, I hear what you're saying. I need to go ahead on and do it. God says, I got you. So if you want to give, set your heart to give. Some of you all may have already purposed in your heart to give a particular thing. That's Bible. Uh, God may speak to you about giving a particular thing. That's Bible because he leads us by spirit. However it is, you know, participate in this opportunity to give. You see the ways to uh, give uh, world changers that uh, world changers space and the amount you can text is 74483. You can call the number there on the screen or write uh, and send in uh, your offering to that address up there. Some of you all may be watching via the websites, uh, Cruffalo Dollar Ministries or worldchangers.org. Just go to the front page and go up to the very top. Uh, there's a give button there that you can give, or you can give via the uh, QR code that we're going to put up here in just a second. You can take your phone, scan that, and of course it'll take you to the text uh, way to give. So. When you give, give cheerfully. There's something about the attitude of giving that is way better than the act of giving. The attitude of giving is much more important than the act of giving. So you give with the right attitude. You give with your love for God, your appreciation for God, your thanks to God. You know, you're just, I, I love you so much, God. I know what you've done for me. You didn't have to do it, but you did it. Thank you, God. Here, here's just something to show my appreciation. So if you have your offerings ready, let's go ahead on and get those uh, where we're going to hold them up. Praise God. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We do it joyfully. We do it cheerfully. We do it with such thanks. We, we do it with such appreciation. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your peace that you give to us. Thank you, Lord, for the comfort of your Holy Ghost. We're just so appreciative for all that you've given us. Lord, this is an expression of our appreciation of it and our thanks. So, Father, we lay this at your feet. We thank, we thank you that it is an acceptable offering. Uh, now, Father, use it to further your kingdom and for your glory. We give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, listen, if you haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, there may be someone in here who hadn't made that decision yet, or many of you all who might be watching via the, uh, the stream. If you haven't made that decision yet, it is the will of God that you get saved. How do I know that? He says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all come into repentance. That's the will of God. He doesn't want people to die. He doesn't want people to go to hell. He doesn't want any of that, particularly since he's made the way. If you want to make the decision to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, he's there. He's waiting on you. He's been waiting. He's been knocking. He's been trying to get our attention for the longest. But let's go ahead on and act today. If you want to do that, then pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, I come before you understanding that I'm in need of a Savior. Lord, I realize that sin has dominated my life. Father, your son Jesus' blood, wash away all my sins. Make me clean. Make me whole. I receive you as my Lord, as my Savior. Come into my heart now. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Woo! Got some chill bumps with that one. Ah, praise God. Listen, you pray that prayer. We want you to text the word, I'm saved, all one word, to 51555. Give us your name. Give us your email address. And we will send you an e-book that will be very helpful in explaining the decision that you just made and helping you in your first walk uh, in this new journey with Jesus Christ. Welcome to the body of Christ. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. 
Well, listen, we, we went a little longer, had a good time, but let's, let's get ready to get you all out of here. So let's stand up. <clears throat> Praise God. Lift your hands. Oh, now to him who is able, who is well able to keep you from falling into any situation, to keep you from stumbling, to keep you from being down. Now unto him who's able to lift you up. Now unto him who's able to strengthen you. Now unto him who gives you peace. Now unto him who calms your spirit, calms your soul, assures you that everything is all right. It's not going to be all right. It's all right. Amen. That everything is all right now. May your confidence in God's love rise and rise and rise like an edifice in your life. May you walk out in full assurance that you are a child of the living God. Amen. Great grace be upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a good one. What if we could take every groundbreaking message on grace, all the life-changing sessions from conferences, and every radical interview with the stars and those with inspirational stories that moved us, and share them with you 24 hours a day? Now we can. This is our network. It can all be found here. Changing Your World Network. Streaming hope, grace, and the wisdom of God with simplicity and understanding. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for free. Download the Creflo Dollar Ministries app on your smart TV and streaming devices. Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, and Begin Streaming. Changing Your World 24-hour network through the app today. Visit cywn.tv for more information now.